Whenever we come to the Word of God, we're not coming as passive listeners. We're coming as humble, ready men and women, if you will. We're ready because the Lord wants to use His Word to teach us, to transform us, to correct us. And so I hope that as you come to the services on Sunday, as you come to our corporate worship gatherings, that you're coming ready to meet with the Lord. Because if I'm doing my job well, I'm going to hopefully deliver to you what this Word is teaching. And I'm hopefully just the medium. I'm hopefully just the person that can quickly be forgotten and the Word of God remains in your heart through the week. In fact, the worst thing that you could ever tell a, um, a speaker of God's Word is, um, man, you're such a great speaker. It's the worst thing. Because the whole point <laughs> is to speak the Word in such a way that that this word takes center stage and that Jesus Christ's glory takes center stage. And all you can think about is how you met with God. And you met with his word and you're transformed by him. And so this morning, we're going to continue in 1 John. And I'm so excited to get back into this exposition of God's word. 1 John will be in chapter 2. Picking up where we left off two weeks ago. First John chapter 2. My title for the message today is The Ultimate Heresy. <laughs> the Ultimate Heresy heresy. Now, the Christian church today can be a little heresy hunting obsessed. This malformation is not necessarily new, but it is taking new forms with the possibilities afforded by social media, right? Anyone with a computer in their office or a phone in the car can immediately rise to the level of influencer. And in the realms of theology, Someone's rant or reasoning can immediately go viral. The credibility, the character, and context of a person is hidden behind the screen, but as long as what is said vibes well, it's shared. And this phenomenon has led to much divisiveness, a lot of name-calling and tension. And the name of choice that is often thrown around is heretic. But we, church, need to be careful in how we use our words. And we need to be intentional with our words. As the band Gable Price and Friends says in their song entitled Heretic, <laughs> actually, no, it's a different song. Softly throwing stones still breaks the windows. We should be wise and winsome with our debate. As 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 24 teaches, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. However, gentleness does not mean a lack of clarity and courage. Clearly in the Bible, there is false teaching. There really is heresy, and there really are heretics. In fact, John, used, John, in the text we're about to read, uses a very extreme word, antichrist. <laughs> you can't get much worse in name-calling than that. So what's this text about? Well, let's read the text first. 1 John 2, verse 18. Children, it is the last hour. 
And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have all knowledge. And you, ha you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Ah, <sighs> John. He writes so, like... It's like, he's all over the place sometimes. You have to slow down to kind of try to figure out what his argument is and, and how he's coming back to it and how, what he's weaving together. Remember my illustration of a Rubik's Cube a couple weeks ago. But what this text is about is this, and I'm just going to summarize it in, in these two sentences. First of all, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. If you come away from this text Remembering and believing and being confirmed that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, then the Word of God has done its work. But it means something, right? Because orthodoxy, what we believe, is going to get fleshed out in how we live. And so the orthopraxy of what we do in light of what we believe is the next part of this text talks about. So, Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, so abide in the confession of the anointed apostolic teaching in the midst of detractors. Abide in the anointed apostolic truth in the midst of detractors. See, there's these guys and girls, potentially, I don't know, doesn't, we actually don't have a lot of information about the specifics of this group. But we do know some things that they believe because John mentions it in this text. But he calls them the Antichrist. And what we see in these first couple verses is that the Antichrist exit the fellowship. But they were never really in it. They exit the fellowship, but they were never really in it. See, look what he says. It is the last hour, and as you heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Now that might throw some of us off a little bit. But what we see in this text is that this, the presence of the Antichrist, plural, signals the presence of the last hour. So what does last hour mean, and what does Antichrist mean? Right? We've got we've to define the terms. The last hour... When John uses the term the last hour in Scripture, it can either be a reference to the time between the two advents of Jesus, that is when he came in his incarnation, and when he will come at his return, and the whole period of time in between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus is the last hour. Right? Because we're in the last days. This is clearly what Galatians 1 fleshes out and what the book of Acts fleshes out for us. That the last days are upon us because Jesus has come and he's inaugurated the new kingdom and it will be consummated when he returns again. This is the last hour. But it can also refer to the final moments before Christ's return. Often the Antichrist, singular, 
is understood as an end time figure who will represent evil, oppose the church, and deceive the nations. However, as we saw in our study of Daniel a couple years ago, I'm sorry just to reference it and not be able to go deep into it like we did, but you can go online and rewatch those sermons. What we saw in our study of Daniel a couple years ago is that the spirit of the Antichrist can be found and has been found in many rulers, popes, kings, and presidents throughout time, even to this present day. A final Antichrist figure will come, but when, where, and who remains to be seen. The apostles and the early church did not know when, where, and who. They didn't know it either. So they, like we, anticipated an imminent return while being watchful in light of Antichrist figures of their day. But John makes an interesting point here. Because one of the signals that it's the last hour is the presence not of an antichrist singular, but of antichrist plural. Huh. Apparently, the presence of antichrist becomes one of the signals that it's the last hour. And we'll see further in the text what characterized the Antichrist, but for now, John's mention of this is to explain something. He's explaining and he's letting them know that he is aware of the social destructiveness of the Antichrist's presence and absence. It's caused a rift in the church. It's caused harm to the community and to the fellowship that these detractors, these secessionists, these people who were a part of the community and now are not a part of the community— it's causing pain and grief and sorrow and even deception. And so what we see next in verse 19 is that the absence of the Antichrist reveals the absence of true fellowship. Look what it says in verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. You see, the Antichrist were a part of of the community. They recognized Jesus as a figurehead, but they began taking a different turn, following influences and thoughts that were contrary to the apostles. What John says here is quite startling. He says they went out, they left us, that it might become plain that they are not of us. Now, as we'll see, this, does, this, this chapter is not talking about anyone who leaves a community of faith. <laughs> This is talking about a specific heresy that will be fleshed out that shows that these individuals, these detractors, were abandoning the gospel and the very true understanding of who Jesus is. The absence of the Antichrist revealed the absence of true fellowship in the community of the church. And when, that, when John says that, that's when we need to be like, okay, whoa. There's people who can be in the church and yet will leave the church and it will reveal that they were never really in the church. It's important here to distinguish between the visible church and the true church. The visible church is every local seen expression of the church, right? That's the visible church. Like what you see here in our membership, in our gathering, or any other church in the area, you see the visible church. But in every visible church, there are converted persons and unconverted persons. There's just no way to avoid this altogether. You can do everything you want and everything you can to try to guard and protect the church from being only made up of sheep and not goats, <laughs> but you can only do and know so much about one another, right? Ultimately, God is the judge of men's hearts. And so we need to recognize, as in Matthew 25, when Jesus returns, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. But some are not just goats, they're wolves, Meaning, they are intentionally attempting to deceive, 
destroy and distract from the truth about Jesus and the gospel. They are attacking essential truths. And so what is the essential truth that these detractors are espousing? Verse 20 through 25. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lies are the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Now we know what they believed. Now we know why these detractors left. Because they were a part of this community and fellowship, but then they abandoned their belief in Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. First, though, John, like the pastor that he is, he gives some encouragement. He tells them, he's telling the people he's writing to, he says, look guys, you have anointed knowledge of the truth. John's encouraging here. He affirms the church because they know the truth and are holding fast to it. This couldn't have been easy. I mean, imagine a church member. Imagine being a church member in this community and the detractors, your friends and fellow church members are trying to convince you that your belief about Jesus is wrong. Imagine being a church leader. And the detractors are attacking your character and your ministry and attempting to usurp your authority in the church by saying that Jesus isn't really the Messiah. John knows this is not just doctrinally important, but it's socially challenging. And so he encourages them by reminding them that they have been anointed by the Holy One. This anointing is a reference to the Holy Spirit. We'll see in the last portion, that we'll see this in the last portion of this text. But let me simply note here that this chapter is the only location where the new, this New Testament Greek word occurs. This is the only place. Refer, reference to this anointing. But remember what Jesus taught his disciples? That the Spirit, when sent, will guide them into all truth. And this church from the beginning of their hearing that gospel truth message, has received the Spirit who continues to teach them and establish the truth in their hearts. They have knowledge by the Spirit. This does not mean that they know everything, but on things concerning the truth about who Jesus is and what he has done and how they are to live for the glory of God, they truly do, through the Spirit, have all knowledge. Like, you should be encouraged by this church because guess what? The same spirit who indwelt them indwells us. We can know the truth about Jesus, who is the truth. No postmodern flimsiness here. This is something we can know in our hearts because it has been true and has been taught by the apostles themselves. We read it in his word and the spirit confirms it in our hearts that it's true. And as a community that devotes ourselves to the apostles' teaching, this is where we have staked our ground. And so John's encouraging them. He says they have all knowledge. You know the church. You know the truth. And we do as well. We know the truth with a capital T. Now this doesn't mean, when it says, don't get confused by this language. When, when John says, you have all knowledge or you know everything, like he's about to say. He's not saying they have like some special access to mathematical or scientific or medicinal or political or psychological knowledge. But it does mean that we as the church know the truth. No ifs, ands, or buts. The truth that is grounded in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. But the detractors, the ones who have left, they deny the truth. Verse 22 who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. 
So what's the false teaching threatening the church? Who are the liars? What's the heresy that would bring John to use such strong language against them? According to these verses, who is an antichrist? Answer, daily double. Now, anyone, anyone who denies that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one, See, there's a play on words that Christ means the anointed one. And charisma is the Greek word that translates anoint, you've been anointed. <laughs> there's a little, little play on words showing the connection with Jesus. But, but John doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, in fact, a denial of the Son as Messiah is a denial of the Father as well. The Father sent the Son and approved the Son, and was well pleased with the Son, and has raised Jesus from the dead, and has bestowed glory upon him, the Son and the Father are one, as Jesus says in John 10, 30. And so to deny the Son as the true Messiah is to deny the Father as well. This is the ultimate heresy. <laughs> That you would deny the Son and the Father. To disagree with the Father and with the, what the Father has said is the ultimate heresy. Right? Because that root of heresy is, has to do with division. You're literally dividing yourself from the Father. You're saying, God, I don't agree with you. Right? That's a problem. <laughs> and so, to disagree, let me put it in syllogism form. I didn't check this. This might not be right. To disagree with, the fa with what the Father has said is the ultimate heresy. To deny that Jesus is the Messiah is to disagree with what the Father has said. Therefore, to deny that Jesus is the Messiah is the ultimate heresy. Unless we think this is just some theological dogma that doesn't have any practical effect, don't miss what John says in verse 23. He says that no one who denies the Son has the Father. To deny the Son means that you do not have the Father. You can't claim fellowship with God while denying His words and resisting His Son. And think about it. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, He doesn't operate apart from the Father and the Son. He also is one with them. For this community to be anointed means they know the truth. Jesus is the Messiah sent by the Father. He is the Son of God. And the Spirit, the anointing one, bears witness in them about this truth. This is huge, especially at the beginning of the early church, because this is, the, this is the foundation of everything we believe. When we say that we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, we are referring to their teaching about who Jesus is and what he has done. And so this means everything for us. This is why we say, like Paul, <laughs> uh, if Jesus has not risen from the dead, then we're of all men most to be pitied. Like, if Jesus truly didn't rise from the dead, then all of this is a sham. And you and I are fools. But we're putting all of our hope, all of our trust, all of our faith that Jesus is the risen Messiah of God. And so he says, guys, these antichrists that are denying the Son... They're denying the Father. They're denying the fellowship. They're, de they're denying the joy of salvation. And then he comes back to the church and he says in verse 24, Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us. Eternal life. Abide. In the apostolic confession that they heard from the beginning that leads to life. 
John calls them to now abide in this apostolic word, the gospel truth that they heard from the beginning. In fact, to abide in this truth by the Spirit is to abide in the Son and in the Father. Remember the beginning of the letter? I don't know if you can remember four weeks ago, <laughs> all right? But let's just take a quick review of the first sermon in John. What was John so excited about? What was the apostle John so thrilled about? We saw that John's greatest joy was fellowship with God and inviting others into that fellowship. Remember what he said in Romans, uh, 1 John 1, 4? We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. He wants them to know joy, which means knowing the fellowship with God. And he says this is what fellowship with God means. This is what it looks like to know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And he invites us into that fellowship. And he go, here he goes again. He highlights the deep fellowship with the Trinitarian God that we can have as we remain and abide in the apostles' teaching the truth of the gospel. And what's the result of this fellowship? What's the result of being in relationship with God? What do we receive as those who are abiding in the Father and the Son and the Spirit? We get eternal life. It's the best investment you can make with your life. You get to receive as a gift from God that you, having done nothing to earn it, but you can receive as a gift from God by faith eternal life. This is what fellowship with God means. And we already are experiencing it. Because we've been saved, we've been risen, we've been brought out of darkness and into light. But listen to what the implication of that is. Those who deny the Son and the Father, who do not recognize Jesus as the Messiah, who do not then have fellowship with God, they are in a tough spot. Because if you do not have fellowship with God, you are denying eternal life itself. If you're denying fellowship with God through the Son, by the Spirit, you are denying eternal life itself. So don't ever let someone tell you theology isn't practical. <laughs> because this is the most practical, eternal reality that we could talk about this morning. Now the Antichrists are not just believing these things. They're also seeking to sway the community that John is ministering to. So what we've seen so far is that the Antichrist exit the fellowship, but they were never really in it. The Antichrist denied Jesus as the Messiah, but they are out of line. And lastly, the Antichrist deceived the church, but they don't have anointed truth. In this last portion of the section, John returns to encouragement and exhortation. Remember the social consequences of these detractors? It's taking its toll. In fact, the detractors didn't just leave. They're actively seeking to deceive the church. And the deception is evangelistic. Often it is. Those who leave the boundaries of apostolic truth, that is the message of the apostles, the gospel that they proclaimed, tend to start by just making a personal decision of absence. Then they begin to confidently, confidently deny it. But often they turn and attempt to save you from your ignorance. Right? Those who abandon the faith, those who are leaving the truth about who Jesus is and what he has done, they will first just leave. Then they will confidently deny and then they will actually come back and say, really, you're ignorant and you should come with me. They will actively seek to deceive. So no doubt the church here is facing some feelings of weakness and self-doubt. But John won't let them go there. Look what he says in verse 26 and 27 and 28. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you received from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, 
just as it has taught you, abide in him. The deception is evangelistic, but the resistance to it will come when they, when they give themselves to truly to the anointing one who teaches them all that the apostles had delivered to them at the beginning. There's kind of a, I think the anointing, and there's some disagreement on what that anointing refers to. I think it is a reference to the Spirit, but in the context, it's clearly also referring to the apostolic message that had been heard. So I think there's some word and spirit interplay in the text. You have the anointing. That is, you have the indwelling Spirit of God. You don't, John says this. The Apostle John says this to this church. You don't even need me to teach you anymore. <laughs> right? He's encouraging them with these words. He's saying, you don't even need me to teach you anymore. The Spirit in you is teaching you about everything, and He is true. Now, now again, this everything knowledge is concerning the things they had heard from the beginning. Right? So, like, he's not telling them, just listen to the Spirit and he'll give you some new revelation. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, listen to the Spirit because he will confirm and expound on the revelation they had already received through the apostles' teaching. And so he encourages them to abide in the confession of anointed apostolic truth, even in the midst of detractors. Abide in this confession. Hold on to this truth. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. He is the fully God and fully human one. So how, how does this message change us? How does this text shape our thinking in our lives? Like maybe you're thinking this morning, I already know this, Ben. <laughs> Maybe you're thinking, why did you just spend a whole sermon expounding a text that tells me everything I, I already believe? I, I, I need you to be aware that there are still those today who deny that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and they're really smart, and they've got YouTube videos, and they're, and they're brilliant people, and they write really smart books, and they know the scripture better than you and me. And they will attempt to deceive us that we're not believing what is true. But we're not listening to them. We're listening to the apostles. We're listening to this word that teaches us that Jesus truly is the Son of God. So if so first of all, to, to those who might have been influenced by or are thinking about what these detractors will say, if you are toying with creative theologies, if you're believing things about Jesus that are different from the clear teaching of Scripture, then please repent of your arrogance and turn back to the truth. Because you can find scholars and theologians and philosophers to make you feel good about what you believe, but to deny the full divinity and full humanity of the Messiah who is one with the Father and the Spirit is to deny the truth. And it will have ramifications on your eternal existence. Take to heart what John Calvin says when he says, for not all the articles of true doctrine are of the same sort. Some are so necessary to know that they should be certain and unquestioned by all men as the proper principles of religion. Such are God is one. Christ is God and the Son of God. Our salvation rests in God's mercy and the like. These truths are non-negotiables. They are clear, and we must hold fast to them, even when really smart people or influential people want to cause us to doubt. That doesn't mean engage, that doesn't mean stop thinking, but it does mean know what the apostles are teaching 
and hold fast. Secondly, for those of you who do confess this truth, for those of you in this room who do believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, abide in the truth. Abide in it. Be encouraged by the fact that you know the truth. The Spirit in you teaches and confirms the confession we have from Scripture, namely that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God. He is the Son of God, one with the Father, and fully God in His essence. He is the descendant of David, born of Mary, fully human. He died on a cross in our place for our sins. He rose again from the dead. He is enthroned as the King of kings, and He offers eternal life. To those who by faith confess him as Savior and Lord. Church, believe this and proclaim it. This is, this is the message of eternal life. We can't sit back. We can't hold it in. We, we have to let our neighbors and our coworkers and our world know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. This is what drives the church, this mission to proclaim this message. It's not just so that we can be saved and comfortable. It's so that we can join God in His mission for the world. And so we need to think about how am I bearing witness to this wonderful and beautiful truth of who Jesus is and what He has done in offering salvation. And we need to do that with winsomeness and with kindness and with gentleness and with courage. Last thing, what you have going on here is a breakdown of church fellowship, right? You have people who are leaving the fellowship because they no longer hold to the essential truth of the gospel. That's not easy. That wasn't easy for John. It wasn't easy for this church. And so then how do we think about church unity and church heresy. How are we going to live in this recognition that there are real heretical doctrines out there that must be called out, that must be condemned? And yet the church is called to a unity, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, right? Like, and yet there's, isn't there disagreement in the church on all sorts of issues? How do we know which ones are ultimate? And which ones are just differences? That's a really important question. And if you don't have a framework for pro and a biblical framework for processing through that, then you can find yourself in great error. Uh, there's a book written by Gavin Ortland entitled "Finding the Right Hills to Die On," and in it he says this: Jesus is the perfect blend of diverse qualities, gentle and lowly in heart and yet unafraid to cleanse the temple and denounce the Pharisees. Most of us, by contrast, tend to tilt either towards courage or gentleness, particularly when it comes to theological disagreement. For instance, we might be naturally careful about theological clarity, but have a blind spot to the destructiveness of divisiveness. In the other direction, we might be horrified at the lack of love some Christians exhibit, but naive to the effects of doctrinal erosion. As Martin Luther noted, softness and hardness are the two main faults from which all mistakes of pastors come. And the same could be said of all Christians. So what am I saying here? I'm saying we need to be aware of our propensity to either doctrinal sectarianism, where we just, we draw the line so close and that, that really unnecessarily divides, and we need to be alert to doctrinal minimalism, which necessarily divides, right? Some things are heretical. <laughs> Some things are heresy. They're not just small disagreements. Some things need to divide, but most things don't. And so the question for us in light of the call of the text is how do we abide in the truth 
in the midst of present day detractors, right? How do we abide in the truth in the midst of present day detractors and not only related to the person and work of Jesus, but even the other things that are getting thrown around today as heresy? How do we know which one means we divide or not? It's a really practical question that a lot of people are asking today. And so I'm going to give you four key principles to help you process that question. Okay? First, we trust and obey. Not just, I'm saying we because this is how one Savior Church is thinking through these things, right? We trust and obey the Spirit-inspired Scripture. We're a people of the Word. We go to the Word to decide what we believe, to understand what is true about theology and about how we are to live to the glory of King Jesus. We go to the Word. But you say, but Ben, there are so many interpretations, right? There's so many interpretations. How can you just say we go to the Word? Okay, second step. Okay. We humbly receive the wisdom and teaching of Spirit-inspired witnesses through the centuries. We don't, we don't commit chronological snobbery like C.S. Lewis called it. Right? Or we think we've got it all figured out and everyone before us, they were idiots. Right? We received the wisdom of church history. So we say the creeds because they've wrestled with this. We recognize the goodness of the church unified around essential doctrines. We commit ourselves to a, con to a confession of faith. We say the Apostles' Creed because it's historically been a unifying reality for the church. But you say, Ben, there's so many denominations. How do you know which trail to take into church history? There's so many, there's so many denominations. And that's where we submitted to Scripture humbly receiving what the church has wrestled with for 2,000 years, we voluntarily submit to spirit-indwelt church leaders who have been tasked by Scripture to guard the doctrine. Voluntarily, okay, the church has made some mistakes with the whole involuntary part, <laughs> okay. We voluntarily submit to spirit and dwelt church leaders who have been tasked to guard the doctrine. We do our theology together in community. But you say, Ben, I don't always agree with the church leaders. Now what do we do? Last point, we keep the gospel central. We keep the gospel central. This is our unifying confession. This is what brings us together into the true fellowship with the Father and with the Son. We look at one another and we disagree on who knows what issue. But we see each other as children of God, sons and daughters of God, beloved royalty in God's family, and we love one another for it. We, we, we seek the scriptures for our truth, and we humbly receive the wisdom of the centuries, and we even voluntarily submit to church leaders. But even when there's still disagreements that remain, we keep the gospel central. Because that is the confession that unites. There's a lot of differences in the church today. Some are antithetical to the gospel and will require courageous resistance. Some might be important disagreements, but require gentleness and humility. Some should divide, but again, most should not. We must keep the gospel central. 
If our minor squabbles with one another lead to church division, then we are not listening to the message of this letter that calls us to love one another. And let's get just towards the disagreements that exist today. Our political theories, our cultural assessments, and medical opinions are not core gospel issues. They should not divide the church. We will not stand before Christ and offer him our perfect thinking. We abide in the truth, capital T, by courageously standing on the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He has done the work on the cross. He has finished the mission. He has offered mercy to the nations. So we lean into the unity of the gospel won for us through Jesus Christ. And we eagerly maintain the unity of the Spirit because we are the anointed ones. And dwelt by the Spirit, holding fast to the confession of truth of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. It's so practical because it's everything for us. And it's the work that the Spirit is doing in us. Would you stand with me? We're going to read together. It's a bit complicated and wordy, but we're going to do something that I believe is true in that is consistent with what Scripture teaches. It's humbly receiving the wisdom through the centuries because this isn't a confession of faith by the Baptists. We're going to read something from the Presbyterians. All right? I know. It's okay. But as a church leader tasked here with One Savior Church to guard the doctrine for this community, this is true. And this is the gospel. And a lot of gospel truth. This is specifically a confession of faith of Christ, the mediator. So, if you want to, please read with me. If you'd like to just listen, you're welcome to do so. It pleased God in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, his only begotten son, to be the mediator between God and man, the prophet, priest, and king, the head and savior of his church, the heir of all things and judge of the world, unto whom he did from all eternity give a people to be his seed, And to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. The Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, being very and eternal God of one substance and equal with the Father, did, when the fullness of time was come, take upon him man's nature with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof, yet without sin." being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary of her substance, so that two whole, perfect, and distinct natures, the Godhead and the manhood, were inseparably joined together in one person without conversion, composition, or confusion, which person is very God and very man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. Now that is a very detailed working out of some really important truths about who Jesus is. And we should humbly receive that and check it to Scripture and go there and find, oh man, this is the truth. Because we read it in the Word and the Spirit confirms it in our hearts and we receive it from the church and we check it with our local community and we submit to the elders and then we go out and we proclaim this gospel message. Because this gospel is what unites us. And it stirs us on to mission. And so let's do that, church. Let's pray together. Lord, we need you to stir in us a desire to know these things and to love these things. And not because they're things, not because they're theology, not so that we can have knowledge that just puffs us up, but so that we can know you. So that we can confess this confession that brings us into deep fellowship with you. Thank you that we can be in relationship with you. 
and that you love us and you've called us and you save us. To you all glory and honor belong. May you be lifted high. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.